key in determining if there will be any future supply and demand imbalances is to try and predict what the future demand of oil will be. What speed will the oil industry need to travel at? To understand the future, we need to understand the past. And this is what this chapter sets out to do. Oil use has continually grown since the birth of the modern oil industry in 1859. With the arrival of the car in the early 1900s, and later the post-World War II economic miracle, oil consumption growth has averaged a rapid 6.9%, almost doubling every decade until 1973. It took two oil shocks and two serious recessions to slow this growth rate down. Since then, growth has averaged roughly 1.5%. In 2010, the world consumed more oil than it ever has, at the rate of 87 million barrels of oil per day. It is truly an astonishing amount. To give you an idea, all the oil used during the six years of World War II would only last five months today. And over the course of a year would look something like this. The developed OECD countries of North America, Western Europe and the Pacific were responsible for much of this earlier growth. But in the last decade, consumption from the 1.2 billion people in these countries has flattened and aided by the recession has dropped by 0.4%. Today's growth comes from the remaining 5.8 billion people on the planet in the non-OECD parts of the world most notably from countries such as China, Saudi Arabia and India. The disparity of wealth and oil consumption becomes much more apparent when we look at a per capita view of the world. Here we can see that individuals of the richer nations of North America and Western Europe are a long way ahead, with the average person using 18 and 10 barrels a year respectively. Middle Eastern consumption is also high, mainly because for them, oil is abundant and made cheap by government subsidy. But also, as they have next to no coal, a much greater proportion of oil is used for electricity generation. By contrast, developing regions of Eastern Europe, South America, Asia and Africa consume far less per person, but their larger populations mean that their total consumption is almost the same. Transport is the dominant sector responsible for this consumption, with the rest spread out between industry, buildings and electricity generation. Light duty vehicles are the most common method of transportation, but total commercial traffic consumes more oil than passenger vehicles. So what is driving this increased oil consumption? In two words, economic activity. More specifically, income per capita is the most important variable impacting oil demand as it allows households to climb the energy ladder. Each rung is faster and more expensive, but also consumes a lot more energy. People from different countries and cultures all across the world spend a remarkably similar proportion of their income and time per day travelling. So, once GDP per person crosses a $3,000 per person threshold, it allows people to reach the rungs of personal vehicles, and the country's oil demand surges. Many developing countries are approaching or have recently passed this threshold which is why oil demand growth from the non-OECD countries will remain strong for the foreseeable future. This increase in income, together with the increasingly globalised nature of trade, are the main reasons why, in the last three decades, every percentage point increase of gross domestic product has resulted in a 0.3% increase in oil demand. This oil intensity is expected to reduce over time. The world economy is roughly twice as efficient with using oil per dollar of GDP today as it was in the 1970s. 
and this general trend is set to continue. But this gradual 1-2% to increase in efficiency over the last few decades has not been enough to overcome the annual 2-4% to growth in the world economy. And the combination has resulted in a global oil consumption profile that has continued to grow at roughly 1.5%. But these are just the end results of the many competing forces that govern the world and your local economy. Understanding the underlying forces is critical to understanding the past, and more importantly, future oil demand. Population is a key driver of economic activity. The world's population is currently at 7 billion, and expected to reach 8.2 by 2030, and more than 9 billion by 2050. Most of this growth will come from Asia and Africa, while the population in OECD countries will be almost flat. Age demographics are also important, as children and the elderly tend to be a lot less responsible for economic growth than those of a working age. More and more of these people are choosing to live in urban areas. Since the 70s, urban areas have been growing at faster rates than rural areas, and today, virtually all population growth is occurring in these zones of higher population density. This has caused the world's cities to grow in size and number. And economic growth is linked with this increase in urbanisation. Commodity prices are also important. The cheaper the basic building blocks of the economy are, the more growth is possible. Today, commodity prices are historically quite high, and are still climbing. According to the World Bank Commodities Index weightings, oil is the most important commodity of them all, and its price can have a big impact on both economic growth and oil intensity. If we look at the history of oil prices, and then adjust it for inflation, we can see that the five largest price movements have a close correlation with periods of recession in the United States. But price is a relative thing. So if we switch out price with crude oil spending as a percentage of GDP, we should get a better picture of what these price movements mean to the United States economy. During these periods of recession, there was not enough spare capacity or emergency stocks in the system to cover the shortage in supply and as a result, this caused oil prices to rise. Prices continued to rise until they hit a point where individuals and businesses decided they could pay no more. This forced a change in behaviour, a phenomenon economists like to call demand destruction. This situation is only alleviated when either supply increases or demand falls enough for prices and the percentage of GDP to normalise. As oil is all of a sudden accounting for an extra 1-6% to 6 of economy-wide spending for no apparent gain, it is not surprising this also leads to economic destruction. Of course this is highly simplified. Oil price is far from the only factor at play, and the price point for different countries and individuals will be slightly different and vary with time. However, the general concept holds true. As does the idea that there seems to be a threshold of around 3 to 4% above which the economy starts to struggle. The reverse is also true, with periods of sustained economic growth being linked to periods where oil spending was around 2% or below. But this is a double-edged sword. As low prices do little to encourage investment in boosting oil supply or end-use efficiency, while doing a lot to encourage wasteful behaviour. This ultimately leads to a tightening supply situation as it did during the early 70s and in the build-up to the July 2008 price spike. So there is a sweet spot where prices are high enough to drive efficiency improvements, but not too high to impact economic growth. 
but this rarely happens of its own accord. But it can be created artificially through government policy. Government policy in the areas such as education, law, standards, research and development, taxation and subsidies are critical in setting the direction, structure and future economic growth prospects of a country. Government policy is also key to shackling or unlocking technological adoption and changes in behavioural patterns that otherwise wouldn't have happened, both of which heavily influence energy efficiency. Policy can be direct, such as efficiency standards for vehicles, which detail a minimum standard before the vehicle is eligible to be sold. But more often than not, policy is indirect, guided by price signals through various forms of taxation and subsidy. Fuel tax is one of the main forms of this. For example, European fuel prices are much higher than they are in the US, and this is all down to the levels of fuel tax. If we look at the cost breakdown, we can see that the crude, refining, distribution and retail components are virtually the same. But the similarities end there. America's flat tax rate of 11 cents per litre has remained unchanged for decades, while in the UK, fuel duty has been consistently raised. And, with a percentage-based VAT, total taxes now account for 60% of the current fuel price roughly 12 times more tax than the average American pays. This is a large part of the reason why the top selling car in the US is this, and in Europe it is this. History has shown that people from all cultures prefer to buy the biggest, most powerful vehicle they can reasonably afford. So cheap fuel generally means lower fuel economy, and greater fuel consumption. Europeans have more efficient vehicles and on average use 60% less fuel per person because fuel taxes have helped create that sweet spot. All the while keeping the weekly fuel bill pretty much the same. This is good for the country too, as taxes are recycled back into the economy and not sent overseas to all exporting countries. All the while continuing to minimise oil dependence. These taxes can also provide a buffer, which can be used to reduce the impact to consumers when the next inevitable oil shock occurs. Most countries are somewhere in between the UK and the US fuel tax wise but a number of countries regulate fuel prices and some, particularly all exporting countries, have pump prices fixed below the market rate for crude oil. When you factor in refining, distribution and a minimal tax rate for road maintenance, the US is considered to have the lowest non-subsidised pump prices. The price gap of anything below this full cost of supply can be considered as an oil consumption subsidy. Globally, oil subsidies fluctuate with consumption, exchange rates and oil price. But over the last four years, oil subsidies have averaged roughly $190 billion per year. This dynamic is a lot more pronounced for the top subsidizers. Although admittedly, much of this represents opportunity costs of what the oil could be sold for. It is one way these countries share their vast profits from oil exports with their citizens. But having fuel so cheap discourages the notion of energy efficiency and has resulted in very high fuel use. If these oil consumption subsidies were removed, it could reduce global oil demand by around 4%. But this will be very difficult to achieve politically. For many citizens, 
cheap fuel is the only benefit they receive from the highly profitable oil industry. And past attempts to increase fuel prices have been met with fierce public opposition, often in the form of strikes and riots, until the government has backed down. Significant reductions to these subsidies will be extremely difficult to achieve. And this is just part of the subsidisation picture. Subsidies also exist for transport, research and development, and oil production, often through tax breaks which are very difficult to estimate. Nobody knows the full number, and it very much depends on the definition of what a subsidy is, and if it includes health or environmental liabilities. In summary, oil demand is extricably linked to economic activity, both usually going up and down with each other. Oil intensity has a multiplier effect which can strengthen or weaken this relationship, but not fundamentally change it. Today's economy is complicated, and there are many interacting forces at play. Some affect the economy, some oil intensity, and a number which affect both. Some are more important than others. Oil price is a big one. Price can make or break economies, and it has the power to change how the world does business. This is evident when we look at the impact the 1973 and 1979 oil shocks had to oil intensity. The economic woes it triggered caused a complete shift from using more oil to create each dollar to using less. But in reality, it only halted the amount of oil the average person used. And so population growth became the main driver behind oil demand increases. But many developing countries are crossing the economic threshold where oil demand takes off. So we can expect an upward change to this trend. But of all these forces, government policy is arguably the most important variable, as it has a spectrum of influence on virtually all of the rest. It shapes the physical infrastructure, which determines the level of dependence each country has on oil, and the extent of impact of which oil prices will have on its economy. So there you have it, the last 150 years in a nutshell. Now that we know how the various forces shape oil demand, we can now look towards trying to predict the future. That is where we are heading now, so please click the link to continue.